Since ancient times, people have wondered about the nature of the world around them. How was the earth formed? What are the origins of living things? How do we fit into the universe? Science allows us to explore these kinds of questions by observing and interacting with our surroundings. That could be some pink curly and algae, but... History has taught us that we have to be careful about how we observe our universe. What is the center of the universe? Well, I think it's self-evident that the Earth is at the center of the universe. Oh, I see. Earth in Greek the ancient Greeks were great thinkers and observers, the universe but they didn't believe in testing their ideas in an orderly, unbiased way. Through the ages, the work of many great scientists has shown that the best way to get accurate answers to our questions is to follow a systematic process of gathering and interpreting information. Today, we call this process scientific method, and we use it in a surprising number of ways. From figuring out why the car won't start, to diagnosing illness and making great scientific breakthroughs, scientific method is the tool that guides us towards an answer to our questions. Oh, it's stuck. <laughs> it got stuck on the side. Around 1860, French scientist Louis Pasteur conducted a famous investigation that has all the features of modern scientific method. By then, it was known that microbes are found in many places. Pasteur himself had found them on dust particles in air and in vats of soured alcohol. The problem was, no one knew for sure where these microbes came from. Many believed they were created by a special life force in the air in a process they called spontaneous generation. Pasteur thought this was nonsense. Like some others before him, Pasteur believed that microbes could be carried by, but not created by the air. So Pasteur formulated a hypothesis, an educated guess that gives a possible answer to the problem. He hypothesized that a flask of broth would stay sterile as long as no airborne microbes could get in and use the nutrients in the broth to multiply. He then tested his hypothesis by conducting an experiment. Pasteur placed broth in special swan-necked flasks and heated them to force out all of the air. As the broth cooled, the air could get back in, but dust and microbes could not because they became trapped in the swan-shaped neck. Pasteur observed that the broth in the flasks remained clear and therefore sterile. When he broke off the neck of the flask, allowing airborne microbes to get in, the broth became cloudy as the microbes grew within it. Pasteur concluded from these results that he should accept his hypothesis rather than rejecting or modifying it. Let's look in more detail at scientific method using another of life's basic questions. How does light affect the growth of plants? 
The answer may seem obvious, but let's see if that's still the case after we've applied the process of scientific method. First, we make some observations. Most plants seem to grow in areas that receive light. Okay, so there's plants growing here where the sun's coming through. Yeah, right. Some flowers open during the day and close at night. <laughs> Not much growing in there. No. And we find very few plants in dark places, such as the rainforest floor. Seeds germinate underground, but they are soon exposed to light. These observations lead us to the question, do plants need light to grow? The next step is to formulate a hypothesis, or an educated guess, that addresses our question. A hypothesis represents a prediction, so it is always a statement rather than a question. Well, all we need now is a hypothesis. So, do plants need light to grow? No, the hypothesis should be a statement. So it should be, plants need light to grow. Yeah. Now we need to test our hypothesis by designing an experiment and making observations. The first step is to identify all the factors that could influence our observations. These factors are known as variables. The growth of plants could be affected by the presence or absence of light. The amount of moisture in the soil the type of soil, and the temperature of the air. To check for the effect of just one variable, in this case light, we need to change only this variable while keeping all the others the same. To do this, we need to set up an environment where we can control all of the variables. A seed box like this one does the job nicely. First, we make a bed of vermiculite and cotton wool and add a fixed amount of water. Then we distribute alfalfa seeds evenly throughout the tray. We can then cover one half of the box so that it receives no light and set it in a sheltered area near a window. This way, all of the seeds are grown in the same material, with the same amount of water, at the same air temperature. The only difference between the two sides of the box is exposure to light, the variable we are trying to test. Now we are ready to gather information or data that will allow us to compare the two sides. We need to decide in advance what data we will collect and how often we will collect it. In this case, we will examine the seed box once a day for seven days and record the appearance of the plants. What we find each day is that the side that receives light grows towards the light and has a green coloring in its leaves. The growth is dense. The side deprived of light grows up straight and is yellow-brown in color. The growth is taller but less dense, more straggly. This is an interesting result. But can we be sure that it is real? and not just something that happened this time around for a reason we haven't identified. One way we can test the accuracy of our results 
is to repeat the experiment. This is an important component of scientific method. The more often the same experiment gives a similar result, the more confident we can be that our observations are accurate. Once we've collected our data, we need to draw conclusions. The data supports our hypothesis. The plants without light don't look very healthy. But that wasn't our hypothesis. Our hypothesis was that plants need light to grow, and the plants without light still grow. So we reject the hypothesis? Well, no, I mean, the amount of light that plants receive is obviously having an effect. So it's sort of right? Yeah. Our data partly supports our hypothesis. We just need to modify our hypothesis and experiment again. Great. <laughs> Maybe our experiment didn't go for long enough. I mean, perhaps the plants without light would have all eventually died. So the hypothesis should be, without light, plants will eventually die. And we'll need to create a whole new experiment. No, we don't. The students already have a basic experimental model that tells them what will happen under a particular set of circumstances. We already know what will happen to the seedlings if we leave them for a certain amount of time. All you have to do is the same experiment over a longer amount of time. Many of the questions we ask about our world don't have simple answers. Often, we need to test a hypothesis in different ways and gather a lot of data before we can be confident that we're on the right track. This allows us to develop a theory. A theory is an overall explanation that accounts for a body of experimental evidence. Theories can also be derived directly from observations. Like the theory of evolution. This theory explains several different observations including fossil records, the similarity of animal skeletons, the fact that some animal species are found only in some parts of the world, and the fact that humans share a lot of their genes with other animals. Theories are difficult to prove. How do we know when we have enough information to be absolutely sure? But for as long as it's not disproved, a theory is the most likely explanation for a given set of evidence. Notice that a theory is an explanation. This is what makes it different to a scientific law, or a so-called law of nature. A law is a statement that describes something that always happens the same way under the same conditions. For example, on Earth, objects that are heavier than air will always fall towards the ground. They obey the law of gravity. But have you ever asked yourself, what exactly is gravity? The law of gravity only describes how the force of gravity acts. It doesn't explain what makes it happen. For that, we need hypothesis and theory. The development of a theory to explain gravity continues to this day. This is the essence of science and scientific method. It doesn't give us all the answers straight away, but it gives us a process for testing our ideas so we can acquire better knowledge.